Good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jasmine Rassi from Bordeaux, uh, who will uh, give us uh, the first lecture of the mini course on wandering domains for polynomials in higher dimension. Thank you very much. So first of all, let me thank you all for uh, for being so many connected, <laughs> even if I'm just looking at my screen now. So I don't see you guys, but I know that you're there. And thanks for the for the invitation to give this um, this course. And also, I would like to apologize because, uh, well, you know, <clears throat> when you go to a conference, then you you go to all the talks and all the money courses, right? But when you are on Zoom, then your life is still happening and you can't go uh, to all the classes. So I'm, I wanted to thank you for putting everything on YouTube. So I will be able to catch up um, every now and then. So uh, what I want to talk to you in this, uh, in this mini course is to present the main ideas of the proof of the existence. Uh, there is something in the chat. It seems okay. Okay, fine. Thanks. Uh, so, <clears throat> sorry. Um, what I was saying is I want to present the ideas of uh, and the techniques of the proof of the existence. So can you hear? Can you see and hear everything? Are you right? Yes, we see. Yes. Yes. So the proof of the existence of a polynomial and the morphism of C2 with a wandering domain. So, well, before getting to the point to why this is interesting, I think that it is a good thing to, well, before going to C2, uh, to start in dimension one and uh, see what, uh, well, I don't know, actually we are too many people, so I can't see all the participants, but I let me start as I always do in dimension one and uh, telling to you what we are interested in and in this kind of question. So why we got to this kind of questions. So we are doing holomorphic dynamics. So the idea is that I'm taking the discrete iteration. So let me stay in dimension one. I take a complex manifold, but actually in dimension one, it's going to be easy. And I want to understand the iterates of a holomorphic map on this complex manifold. So I'm going to consider F n times, which is simply I compose F with itself n times. And I want to understand the asymptotics. And when you try to do such a thing, then <clears throat> of course you can ask, okay, there are easy maps. So if I stay in dimension one, well, my complex manifold could be C and I could take a holomorphic map on a morphic function on C, or I could also have C had the Riemann sphere. And uh, I think I put too many, uh, no, it's fine. So if we start with an example, there are some polynomials. So let's take a polynomial, f of z a polynomial in one variable. What I could consider the baby's examples that I can have in mind, I could take f of z, which is a z plus b, or f of z, which is z to the power d, a, mon a monomial map, or f of z equals to z squared plus two, or minus two, let me put minus cz. And actually, so in this case, we can say whatever we want. We can say, we can describe um, in a very complete way, uh, the dynamics. So this, the asymptotics, the asymptotical behavior of F iterated many times. So for example, so this is uh, somehow a baby exercise if you want. 
For example, let me put X and you will say, decide what to do with that. So if you consider F of Z, which is AZ plus B with A and C and B complex numbers, then you can show that F modulus of A is different from one or A is equal to one and B is different from zero, then, well, <clears throat> if you send Z to, okay, let me introduce myself. Uh, it's only mega limit. So if you take complex point NC hat, so let me start by this so that I can uh, introduce self. So this map is going to be constant. And what is the omega limit? Well, let me remind it to you. So this is simply, by definition, the set of accumulation points. And so I'm staying in the, uh, in the compact case so that I have no problems in saying what this is. And you can also define it in a with a formula. So it's the intersection of the forward orbit of Fn of x closure, where this is, sorry, where O plus of Fn, well, let me put it, of a point is simply, I'm taking the union of Fn of x, P, sorry, as n is bigger than zero. Okay, and you can also prove that in all the other cases, so what I'm saying is that with this affine map, if modulus of one, A is not one, or if A is one, so I have a tangent to the identity affine map, but B is different from zero, then this map is going to be constant. So, and what happens more is that in all other cases, so omega Z, in the other cases, omega z depends on z. And is either finite or an Euclidean circle. All right, so this was a nice, easy example. So what happens if I consider this kind of map? So if I consider F to, so this was say one, O, A. Example B, if I consider F of Z, which is a power map with D at least two now, what's happening is that the omega limit set of any point in the disk is going to be zero. So if I make a uh, small picture here, when I take a point inside the unit disk, then, all, then its orbit is going to be accumulating the origin. And whenever I have a point outside the closed unit disk, then in here, what's going to happen? Well, I take a point in here and I take it's this power. So it's going to, uh, its modulus is going to grow and grow and grow. And at the end, I'm going to accumulate to infinity. And so, and actually you can also prove that whenever you are now in, uh, let me use this whenever I take a point in the unit circle, since this power map is not going to change the modulus of, the, of my point, I'm going to stay and rotate on, in the circle. So the omega limit set of Z is contained in the unit circle if Z was in the unit circle, and it can be equal. to the unit circle. But it can also be a finite set of 
arbitrary cardinality. So the last example that I wanted to, to talk about was, remember I had this z squared minus two. So in this case, you can write uh, every point, uh, so every point in, uh, in C, so for every Z and C, I can write it as one over W plus W for some W in C. And by using this, well, with, sorry, Okay, let me check in my notes. So the modulus of W is going to be equal to one if Z belongs to the segment minus two, two. And the modulus of W is going to be bigger than one if uh, Z belongs to C hat, C minus, minus two, two. And by using this, so this is the key step to prove that well, let's say A, the mega limit set of Z is going to be equal to infinity if Z belongs to C at minus this real segment, and it's going to be contained in this segment minus two, two, if Z belongs to minus two, two. So these three examples are somehow typical because I could say everything I wanted about the iterates, all right? So in most cases, um, we have more fractic and chaotic behavior. And uh, well, these analysis require more complex analysis, more tools coming from dynamical system, complex analysis and topology and combinatorics and et cetera. So, in my, uh, so in this title, I said, oh, with a wandering domain. So I want, to, I want to prove the existence of a map with this kind of domain, but what kind of domain related to dynamics? So let me introduce once more in your life, the Fatou set and the Julia set. So the idea is that the Fatou set is going to be the part of the Riemann sphere where the dynamics is going to be tame. It is going to be the place of the Riemann sphere, let's say, where I, I consider the omega limit set and this omega limit set is going to depend continuously, continuously on the initial point that I take. And the Julia set is going to be this complementary set and it's going to be where chaos happens. So when you want to do it, this kind of partition, which is the partition that was originally proposed by uh, Fatou and Julia themselves in their works, you have to give a good definition. And the good definition in holomorphic dynamics is the one based on normal forms. Oh, sorry, normal uh, families. So let me put a definition in here. So a family Fi, Fj, say from U to C hat of holomorphic maps on an open subset U of the Riemann sphere is normal if from any sequence, uh, in the family, let's say the n, but then bigger than zero, I can extract a convergent subsequence, so a subsequence. Converging, sorry, 
uniformly for the spherical metric uh, in the range on compact subsets. Of you. So when we use normal families, uh, we're going to be able to, uh, to define, so the Fatou set, so the Fatou set, f of f of map of a rational map from the Riemann sphere to itself is going to be simply is the largest open set in C hat where the family of iterates is normal. And the Julia set, oops, sorry, let's put it in red anyways. J of F is its complementary set. It's simply C at minus the for two set. So if I go, oh, before I forget, there is a, um, a very important sequence, uh, a very important uh, theorem uh, in this theory in dimension one, which is due to Montel. So let me put it here, so theorem, which tells you that if you have a family of homomorphic maps omitting uh, at least three values in the renal sphere, this family is going to be normal. So if, this family omits uh, at least three points in C at, then the family uh, is normal. And this means that in particular, if I have a, ba a bounded sequence of holomorphic maps landing in C, then it is going to be normal. So, from U to C, is always normal. Because when you're bounded, well, you're omitting more than three points in the Riemann sphere, all right? Excuse me, just me. Yes. So omitting three points is that uh, these three points, none of them are in the images of all the FJs, right? Yes, exactly. If you, if you consider all the ranges, then you are taking, well, all the ranges are omitting these three points. Thanks. Well, thanks to you. So, th so this means that I'm still talking to somebody. Fine, <laughs> good. So, uh, if we go back to uh, well, for to my favorite example in here. So, in these three examples, my favorite example is going to be this one. And I try to understand who the Fatou set and who the Julia set here is. Well, this is not so difficult to do. Okay. So yes. So let me go. Well, let's do it in green so that we change the color. So example, if I now consider again f of z, which is my power map, d at least two, if you, well, actually, if you want, we can also, well, the set, what I'm going to say is going to hold also for d less than or equal to minus two. So in here, the Julia set, is the unit circle. And how do I get it? Well, this is easy. So you will, so usually if you ever listen to one of my talks on this topic, usually I just take 
d equal to, and I said, well, you know, you consider the iterates, that's easy, and you see what we said before, let me go back in here. Whenever I take a point in the unit disk, it's going to converge to the origin, it iterates. Whenever I take a point in the, in the outside the closed unit disk, its iterates are going to converge to infinity. And actually what I'm saying is that this is going to, uh, to arrive uniformly in a small neighborhood of this point. And this is true for every point in here and every point in the unit disk. Then I know that the unit disk and the complement of the closed unit disk are in the photo set. And whenever I take a point in the unit circle, now, well, you see, you see the point in here, I have more or less half of the neighborhood that is going to be in the unit disk. And so of points going where, whose orbits are going to converge to the origin and half of the points in here are going to converge to the to infinity. So it can't be in the, um, in the Fatou set, so it has to be in the uh, Julia set. But if you do this, and you take a, um, any, uh, any D, so it could be also not an even number, then, well, you have to be a little more careful, but still. So what's going to happen is that, so in fact, so you can have a proper proof of this. This family, um, so the family of iterates, Fn from C at minus um, S1 to C at. Well, this takes its values and C hat minus S1. So S1 is more than three points. So it emits three more than three values. So by Montel. I have that it is normal, which means that J of F is contained in S1. And to prove that G of S is actually equal to S1, then you can argue, so one can argue, that for, say for D at least two, the sequence F iterated two times N, then at least zero converges uniformly on any compact subset. of uh, D to the constant map zero and on any compact set, I don't know why, why I put this to, yes. Of C hat minus D bar to infinity, okay. And so now in any neighborhood, now if I take a point Z in S1 and I take for every neighborhood of Z, in, well, let's say Z not in S bar, well, we'll have that, uh, let's call it U, U intersect at D is going to be non-empty and U intersect at with the complement of the unit disk is going to be non-empty. And so there is no neighborhood of Z naught where the family of iterates is normal. All right, so we have this example telling to us some stuff because if I 
now try to have a better image. I'm not so good in drawing circles. Anyways, so now what I know is that all this part, the unit disk is going to be in the fatu set. Well, let's say then the outside part is going to be in the fatu set. So the fatu set is not connected. So a first remark is that the fatu set, well, does not, uh, well, doesn't have to be to be connected. So I can consider, so I can define if a two component as, so it's simply a connected component. of the FATU set. And in here, what I see is that this FATU component is sent by F into itself, and this FATU component is sent by F to itself. So I can ask to myself, is the FATU set completely F invariant? Is it the same for uh, the Julia set? And this is exactly what happens. So you have a proposition which is not so difficult to prove, telling to you that the Julia set and the Fatou set are completely F invariant. So if I consider F of the Fatou set of F, this is equal to F inverse, sorry, of the Fatou set of F, and it's equal to the Fatou set, and the same happens to the Julia set. And this is something coming back. Actually, the proof is I'm not going to do it today because, oh my goodness, it's already 4.30, 2.30. And it's like, I'm, I'm being so slow uh, in doing all this stuff. So uh, I'm not going to do it, but it's simply something coming from complex analysis in dimension one, okay? So the idea is simply that when you take a family of maps, which is normal, and then you, Compose it with a holomorphic map, holomorphic function is going to stay normal. Okay, so this is the key point. Jasmine? Yes. Are the Fatou components also completely F invariant? Well, it depends on what you want to say. I mean, the Fatou set is going to be sent into itself. So now you have a new um, dynamical system, which is given by the fact that I have my FATU components and I'm sending a FATU component into another FATU component, okay? So of course, you are always getting another FATU component, but uh, what do you mean by being completely F invariant there? I mean, the orbit could be infinite or the orbit could be finite. No, I, I, I meant if, uh, for instance, in this example, the the inside of the disk goes to itself. It doesn't go to outside. So there is no uh, switch in between the FATU components. In this particular case, but in, uh, so this is just an, a, um, a case of, the, of an invariant FATU component. So if you have an invariant FATU component, of course it's going to stay there. But so you in could general, they can- Yes, exactly. Move around. Exactly, this is where I was going to go. So yes, let me, I think I'm, I'm doing more or less what I wanted to do. Before I forget, let me also say that the Julia set of an iterate of F is going to be equal to the Julia set of F and the Fatou set of the iterate of F is going to be equal to the Fatou set of F for every k in n. So now what we are going to have is that, so we started by f acting of c at, okay? We got to the Fatou set and we have an action on the Fatou set given by f, f sends a Fatou component
on to another fatu component, which could be the same, actually, onto a fatu component. And so, well, we have two kind of things. So, uh, given omega a fatu component. Well, either the orbit of omega under F is finite or it is infinite. So what happens when it is finite? Well, when it is finite, what I'm saying is simply that I have my photo component, for me, for in my in my ad, it's always something like a small potato, and so it has a finite orbit. So either it is going back. It's, I iterate well a little, and then I end up in a cycle of photo components, or I'm already in a cycle of photo components. Okay, and the other case is that while well, I have an infinite orbit, so I never get back. To one of the images. So in this case, I'm wandering around. Okay. So in this case, I call this case a wandering domain. And in here, well, simply in this case, I have a pre periodic component. And so, yes, I still have 10 minutes. Yeah, more or less. Yes. Thanks. So in this 10 minutes, so let's see what happens in dimension one. So in dimension one, if I am working in the Riemann sphere, then, well, we can say something on this case and we can say something on this case, meaning that whenever you have a nor a, if a two component, which is periodic or pre-periodic, then you can ask yourself, okay, say it is periodic. Say I consider an iterate of my, um, of my map so that I have an invariant for two component. What can I say about the component? Can I say something about the dynamics inside the component? Can I say something about the geometry of the component itself? Is it going also always to be simply connected? Can it be infinitely many connected? I don't know, okay? And in this case, uh, you can ask whether you can have a one-way domain or not, all right? So I'm, I'm telling to you the story upside down. So let me answer first to the second question. Well, the answer to the second question is no. In dimension one, for the Riemann sphere, if you have a rational map, which is uh, of degree at least two, then you cannot have a wandering domain. And this is something which was proved by Sullivan in 1985. Okay, so let me put it in red. So theorem, Sullivan, 1985. Okay, so FF from CR to itself is a rational map. of degree d at least two, then f has no wandering domain. Which means that I'm always in this pre-periodic case. So every photo component for this kind of map has to be pre-periodic. So now if I'm able to classify what happens for to um, uh, invariant for two component, I'm able to say everything, right? So, and actually we have to go back. So let me change color. Let me put it in green. We have to go back to uh, the beginning of the, the 20th century. So we have a theorem due to to many people, but 
it was first conjectured by Fatou. So it's the beginning of the 20th century. And so actually, so let F from C at itself be a rational map of degree D at least two and omega be an invariant the two component then omega is well it cannot be anything it only has three kind of behaviors so it's either an attracting domain which means that I'm going to have a fixed point inside of omega and all orbits are going to converge to this fixed point. So the dynamics inside omega is going to be uh, like the one that I had for z to the power d. Okay? Or a parabolic domain And in here, what I'm going to, what is going to happen is somehow similar to this situation, but this time my fixed point is going to be um, at the boundary. So I have my omega, I have a fixed point here, and all iterates are going to convert to this fixed point. So it's somehow, uh, one could think about it like a degeneration of this first uh, kind of uh, figure. And then, The last case is I could have a rotation domain, which can be of two kinds. Either I have a single disk, meaning that I have somehow, so there is a fixed point somewhere, and on my omega, I have that. Omega is topologically equivalent to a disk, and on omega, orbits are accumulating on circles, well, circle, quasi-circles around this fixed point. So in this case, I can also, well, in all cases, I have a normal forms, but I will maybe go back to that tomorrow. So in, in this case, all orbits are rotating around this fixed point, so there is no orbit accumulating on my fixed point. Or I could have an Ehrman ring. So in this case, I have something which is going to be holomorphically equivalent to an annulus. And again, on this annulus, so there is no fixed point anymore, and I have a rotation inside. Okay, so and the, just to make a small remark, so this case cannot happen for polynomials. So as I was telling to you at the very beginning, I'm going to be interested in polynomial endomorphisms in C2. So I'm not, in my mind, I'm not going to have this kind of Ehrman ring stuff, okay? So, and if you, if you don't like to work with rational maps in, uh, in, C, in C hat, just think about polynomials. So if you think about polynomials, you take out this last case. So I think I have still two more minutes. Uh, five minutes, actually. Oh, five minutes. Oh, wow, I have plenty of time. Cool. So in here, um, I will not go into the proof of these two results. That's uh, for sure. Uh, this result is classical. And well, you see there is a, well, 85 years in between the two. So what happens with Sullivan's result, which is a powerful result, this kind of result cannot hold like this. Well, this proof cannot hold in dimension, in higher dimension, in dimension two. The problem being that, that this, the proof of Sullivan relies on the fact that 
in dimension one, we have more structure than the one that we're going to have in higher dimension. So in dimension one, you have the uniformization theorem. In dimension one, you can't have a proper subset of C, which is bilomorphic to C, which is something that can happen in higher dimension. But knowing that a proof of, well, of a result cannot adapt like it is in higher dimension doesn't tell you any about, anything about what can happen in higher dimension, okay? I mean, you just know that this proof is not working. So what? You could, have, you could find another one. So in, uh, well, what happens is that this result cannot hold in dimension two because we found an example of a polynomial of the endomorphics of, the, uh, of C2, which has a wandering domain. So not only the proof doesn't go in higher dimension, but it's, it's simply not true. And so the, uh, the main point of what I want to, to tell you in the next uh, uh, three lectures is to how to prove, so in dimension two, so let me put it here, not in, well, let's go back to blue. So in dimension two, so there is an example. Well, actually now there are more, but well, I will talk about the first one. There is an example. Of holomorphic endomorphism of C2, which is polynomial with a wandering domain. And its proof relies on what is called local dynamics. So, so usually, so what we've been doing today was global dynamics, we were at this uh, iteration of, uh, of a function and we wanted to study, well, the old space. So what happens to this antithetic behavior for the full, uh, for all orbits, right? Usually what you say, it's local dynamics, you take a particular point, maybe a fixed point, like in here, like in here, and like in here, and you just restrict yourself to what happens in the neighborhood of this fixed point. You restrict yourself to this neighborhood and you want to know, okay, can I classify the accumulation points of all orbits in this neighborhood? And so you forget about everything else and you say, okay, but if I have, I'm working in a fixed, at a fixed point, I can simply work with germs. I can forget about the fact that I was living in C hat or C whatever. I stay near my fixed point and I consider my iterates and I see what happens. And actually this is something that it is also related to Fatou's classification, well in here and here and in here. And what I'm going to be interested in, well let's say tomorrow, is to understand better what happens to parabolic domains. So where do they come from and what we can say on that. And this is, essentially the key, uh, the key uh, ingredient in this proof because what we used was, well, the fact that we know about uh, parabolic dynamics and parabolic implosion, and we could adapt it in higher dimensions. So I think I am out of time. So I'm stopping here for today and tomorrow we will go back. So let me put it like this. We will do some parabolic dynamics tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Are, are there any questions or remarks? Yes. Uh, uh, you are saying that uh, Denis Sullivan result about a uh, wonder domain that not works for a uh, map on C2. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, how about uh, his his results about the number of uh, periodic dom uh, fatu domains? This works or not? So I'm not aware of this. I think I think it relies on things that we are not uh, able to prove in higher dimension, not yet at least. But I'm not sure. I'm not an expert in um, 
in one variable. So you see, I, I did some st stuff in one variable. Tomorrow we'll do one variable again, but I'm more in higher dimension. And I'm almost sure that the bounds that he has, has uh, require uh, some inequalities that you don't have in higher dimension, or at least not in full generality. Of course, there is something that I didn't say, but I will say it again tomorrow, is that whenever you take a map in dimension two, which is of the form f of z w going to f of z g of w, and you take f and g one dimensional polynomials, then okay, you, can, you will be able, able to, to do whatever you were able to do in dimension one. All the components you get are simply products of components. So you can count periodic components, three periodic components. You have bounds. You know that you can't have a wandering for two components in there because otherwise you would have one for uh, each of these two maps. But I think when, that whenever you go in the full generality of higher dimension, uh, I'm not aware of such a bound. But, but in the Sullivan term, you also have uh, the classification of the periodic components, right? There is just a fine number of types. So yes. in the higher dimension, you have this part at least. I mean, can you classify? No, you cannot. No, so it depends. So actually, whenever you go to higher dimension, then there is a, uh, then you try to restrict yourself because if you take all the possible endomorphisms in, in the world, then it's going to be too much. So you have some classification for NN maps, which are, uh, sorry, so let me say it correctly. For recurrent components of NN maps, so this was due to, I think, it's due to Fornes and Sibonini, and there is also that Fornes Smiley. And there was, so in dimension two, this was completed by uh, Lubitsch and Petters, but for, um, the, the, so they were not for all kind of anon maps. So they are in this dissipative case. And I have, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that they have a condition of, um, of the Jacobian, which has to be, uh, well, not too small or not too big, one of the two, I don't remember. And so I think in the conservative case, you don't know yet. And if you leave NN maps, which means if you leave polynomial automorphisms of C2, that then you can have, well, there is still place to work and you can have a lot of things that cannot happen in dimension one. So for example, you could have like a, an elliptic fixed point, meaning that you have a fixed point with uh, eigenvalues, so say you are in C2 are elliptic, so rotation, so you would expect to have rotation, but you have some parabolic dynamics. And it could also, and actually, so in a higher dimension, what you, well, uh, people was thinking, okay, it will always be more or less like uh, bioelomorphic to C2, my photo component, if it is big enough and et cetera. But you can also have C star cross C. So the classification is not yet completed. We know a lot of stuff, but not it's not like in dimension one. And and uh, I mean, following the question of Wilton, uh, in the case of wonder domains, can you bound the number of orbits of, of uh, wonder orbits in, in the polynomial case? Or? Not really. Mm. Not really. And actually, so this is so. What I'm going to tell it's an example. The example that we made. But there is now a new one, which is a very nice uh, result due to Pierre Berger and Sébastien Bibler, who uh, proved that you can have a polynomial automorphism of C2, which has a, um, a wandering for two component, but I'm not sure that in their proof, well, I, I'm not sure to understand their proof, but that's my fault. And I'm not sure that they have a bound. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? So if not, let's thank Jasmine again. Thank you.